great song that is you know I was thinking as we were singing that song there was a time when Jesus was telling some hard truths to the people who were around him and he was starting to gather a number of followers and they were you know he's sort of getting sort of that somewhat celebrity status which happens in our world and then Jesus started talking to them about the challenge of following God and what it takes to follow God and a number of people couldn't take the information he was sharing with them and so they dispersed because the truth was too hard on maybe you've seen that movie where one man says, you know, you can't handle the truth. And uh, they laugh a little. But that's what happened here, that Jesus was telling them some basic truths, and so a number of them dispersed and left. And then Jesus said to his closest followers, do you want to leave too? And they said, well, to whom else would we go? They said, you have the words of eternal life. And maybe today... You've been straying from the Lord, and he's inviting you to come home to him. And if that's true, I trust that you are listening to his spirit and would be cooperative with his spirit. You know, when I go to prepare a message, sometimes you get a little lost and confused in the preparation of the message, or you get that block when you're thinking about a biblical message. And that happened this week, and I could not come up with a title for the message. And so Enrique came into my office, and we sat there, and he said, well, what verse are you speaking on? And I said, well, I'm speaking on that verse where Paul says, think on these things. Well, how about that? He said, that's a good title right there. (laughs) Think on these things. So thanks for titling the message today for me, Enrique. Yes. Think on these things. And it's a part of this letter that we're walking through that Paul has written to the believers in Philippi. And we're getting near the end of the letter. And of course, when you come to the end of a letter, I, for one, am a little sad about the fact that we're going to come to the end of it because I've enjoyed walking through this letter so much. It's the handbook for joy and God has taught me more about joy as we've been walking through this letter in spite of any circumstance that we're in in the world. Paul has some instruction for us to experience the joy that God has for us and as you read through this letter you see that God wants to birth so many different fruits of the spirit in us that sometimes we live beneath our privilege of what he's offered to us because of who we are as human beings. And so Paul is writing this letter, and at the end, he's going to encourage them with some final exhortations. Now, there's been a couple women who have been bickering together in Philippi. And so Paul addressed them and said, we got to get over that, ladies. We gotta, there's something more important at stake here. we got to think about sharing the love of Christ with the world around us. And so he encourages them to kind of patch things up and move on from there. And then he gets into this final exhortation where he says in verse 7, Rejoice in the Lord always. He says it about 14 or 15 times in this letter. He comes back to it again here at the end. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Paul is in prison writing this letter. But his connection with the Lord has given him such great joy. The Bible speaks of an inexpressible joy that's available to those who grow closer and closer to God. Not because of the circumstances we have, but because of the presence of the Lord and who God is. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. And then he says, let your gentleness. Here's two fruits of the Spirit. Joy and gentleness. Gentleness, we learned a couple weeks ago, is actually a word for reasonable tenderness. Reasonable tenderness. 
Sometimes we could get overly compassionate with someone. We could have a little too much of a pity party with them. Other times we could get too hard-hearted with people. But this gentleness is appropriate tenderness for the situation that you're dealing with. Let your appropriate tenderness be made known to everyone. This is the Spirit of God works this in us. Because the Lord is near. He's with us. He's promised to be with us. And because he's with us, there's no reason to be anxious about anything, stirred up, distracted in our hearts and minds because of the presence of Almighty God and his love for us, his kindness for us. And so he continues in his final exhortations, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation with prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Pray about everything. And then he says, the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, it goes beyond our minds, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Those two words jumped out at me this week, hearts and minds. Because when it goes beyond our understanding, it goes beyond our intellect and our thinking into our hearts as well. And that's when you experience a supernatural peace, which is to say, to observation, in God's eyes, our hearts and minds are so closely tied together that if they're separated from each other and the heart is very restless but your mind is trying to suppress it you don't know that supernatural peace and if your mind is very anxious but your heart is at rest you still don't know that peace God wants that peace to encompass all of us to have integrity between our heart and our mind so they come together as one you see the word salvation is wholeness And wholeness means you come from the beginning, from the inside to the out, whole as one. And so what's happening in your mind and what's happening in your heart are in congruence with each other and there's integrity there. And when there's peace in both, in the midst of a mad world, that's supernatural. That's a peace that comes from outside of the world. So God wants us to understand how closely our hearts and that our Christian development, he wants them guarded and shielded so we can know this peace. And so our Christian development is not just about the mind and not just about the heart. It's about both of them tied together, the heart and the mind, as God works in us to will and to please his good pleasure. And I believe the scripture teaches us that if we're doing our part in working out our salvation, as Paul said in Philippians 2, And doing our responsibility that he instructs us in, he will also do his work. See, I think it's more important for God to work in our hearts because no one can work there. But he's given us freedom in our minds. And so there's this cooperative effort as God works in our hearts. He also says, you do your part. Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For I, God, am going to continue to work in you to will and to please for your good pleasure. And this is really good so that as we grow as Christians, here's the truth then we don't take a lot of credit for it. We just give praise to God that miraculously, somehow, we've been growing in a supernatural way. And he's been involving us in it, and we need to keep doing our part, depending on how far we want to go with him. But he doesn't want us getting arrogant or proud about where we're at spiritually. And so there's this cooperative effort, and God wants to work in both of us. He's going to work in our hearts. He's going to give us a new heart, the Bible says. Put a new spirit within us, deep within our soul. But then he says, you got to watch your mind. you got to pay attention to what's going on up here. And this is where we get to our thought life. And I want to make a few observations about our thought life before we get into what Paul says in this verse today. The first observation is this. Our thought life is secret. It's private which is to say no one really knows about your thought life or my thought life except for you and the Lord. He sees all things. He knows all things. All things are laid bare before him. So he knows what's going on in your heart and your mind and what's going on in my heart and my mind all the time. The good thing to remind yourself of when you know that is that he loves us. But our thought life is completely secret and private to the outside world. Only you and God know what's going on there in your mind. God has given us that autonomy, that privacy. I would also make this observation about our thought life. It can be influenced. 
For some people, it's more easily influenced than others. But the scripture says the people we hang around with will influence our thought life. Iron sharpens iron, so one man, one woman sharpens another. Bad company corrupts good morals, it says. People influence our thought life. In the world today, does anyone know how many television channels we have? I know it's over 500 because every TV comes with at least 500 channels on it now. There's 500 channels in the world today. There's magazines. There's newspapers. There's radio stations. There's this thing called the World Wide Web. It's the mass of information that we know into the world. There's, there's billboards when you drive around town, and there's a constant flow of information coming into our thought life. And we can be easily influenced, and we are as a people influenced by all the messages that come to us from the world today. We have what happens in our hearts and minds, a word called desensitization to what's going on in the world. When I was younger, and I think it was about the fifth grade, I was having a birthday celebration with some friends, and one of my friends suggested we go see a movie, and my mom asked what it was rated. She said, it was, he said, it was, I think it's PG. Well, I'd never been to a PG movie. And so my mom said, well, for your birthday, we'll go to a PG movie. We got in there, and I think it was in the first five minutes, uh, the word that starts with F that you probably all know about was used three or four times. And then a gentleman took up one of his fingers near the middle of his hand and shared it on there. And I was, as a youngster, seeing this, and I was shocked by what was happening, but not near as shocked as my mom, because she said it was time to depart the movie theater. (laughs) And all of us left the movie theater at that time from a few curse words and a bad representation from a hand. I can tell you what now, I see more at the halftime of a Super Bowl than I saw at any movie when I was younger. The desensitization that's coming to us is coming at a constant flow around us. And we can be influenced by what's happening. And the Bible says we shouldn't even give the devil a foothold, even a doorway into our hearts. That is our responsibility. We are easily influenced. Another observation about our thought life is that our thought life, God has made it this way, it's under our control. We may for a minute lose control of our thought life, But God has given us the capacity to come back, gather our thoughts together, and then choose what we're going to think on and what we're going to put our minds on. Our thought life is secret. It is easily influenced. It's under our control by God's grace and his kindness. He has not given us a spirit of timidity or fear, but a spirit of power, love, and of a sound mind. That's what comes from God. Our enemy is the author of confusion. God has given us the capacity to choose our thought life. And then the fourth observation I would make is this. Our thought life is creative. It's very creative. In the sense, it's powerful in that way. Everything that we see here today began in someone's mind. These projectors are put together by people who understand technology and all that. That's a lot of mind work to bring about something like that. Every bridge we drive on, every road we ride on, every house we enter, every chair we sit in began in someone's mind. The mind has the power of creation. When I started preaching, there was all these short little pulpits. And I got bothered with these short little pulpits like this and these frail ones And so early on, when we just came to town, I started to think in my mind, how could I get a pulpit that's a little taller and it's got a little more space for papers on it? And so instead of building a projector like that, I put together a simple pulpit like this in my garage. Everything that exists that man has created started in the recesses of someone's mind and heart. It's a very powerful tool that we all have. As a matter of fact, our whole lives and how we lay them out and how we live them ultimately come from our thinking and our decisions and our choices that we make on our thoughts. And this is what Solomon has said about that in Proverbs 23, 7, where he said, as a man or woman thinketh, so is he, or so do they become. We create our lives in a lot of ways in cooperation with God by what we're thinking about in our mind. And so Paul is coming to the end of his exhortation here, and he's focused on the mind. He's talked to them about their heart and their anxiousness and prayer. He's talked to them about making choices to rejoice and enter into the peace of God, but to stay there. 
we have to master our minds. And so Paul gives this instruction. And he gives it in such love because he loves these people. He wants what's best for them. He wants what all that God has for them. Finally, he says, brothers and sisters, he sees them as family. Because we're in the eternal family of God together, those that know Christ. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, pure, Lovely, admirable, excellent, praiseworthy. Think on these things. Our responsibility in so much of the Christian life is to pay attention to what's going on in our minds. God promises to be at work, but we're to channel our minds. Hear how Paul said this to those in Rome, he said, those who are dominated by the sinful nature, the old nature, the human nature inside of us, they think about sinful things. Their mind is set on sinful things. But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit, those things that are true and noble and praiseworthy and excellent, of good report. Letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death, but letting the Spirit control your mind and putting your mind on the things of the Spirit leads to life and to peace. We have a responsibility in this, and it's a battle. The primary spiritual battleground that we have is right here in our minds. I've told the story about the young Indian boy who was being trained up by the elders in his tribe, and they were teaching him about the moral and respectful ways they wanted them to behave in the tribe and how they were to treat each other. And finally, the Indian boy, one day in exasperation, went to the chief and he said, I understand what all you're teaching me, but I got to tell you, you're teaching me these things, that you want me to do this and you want me to operate in this way. But inside of me, sometimes I get really jealous. And sometimes I get angry. And other times, someone takes something of mine and I want to go beat them up. And he said, there's like two dogs fighting inside of me. One wants to do what you're teaching me, and another wants to do its own thing. And the little Indian boy said to the chief, all I want to know is which one's going to win? Which one's going to win? And the chief sat there for a minute, and he wisely said back to the Indian boy, I'll tell you which one's going to win. The one you feed the most. The one you feed the most will win. Life and peace is available to us. Whatever we feed the most, the things of the Spirit or the things of the flesh, eventually going to have its result. I want to give you a real profound spiritual truth today. You may have never heard it this way, but I want to give it to you this way. God has not created human beings to be moral garbage. He has not created us with that, to be moral garbage cans. There's a philosophy out there that's garbage in, garbage out. And we think we can do that, garbage in, garbage out. But my question today is, why put any garbage in? I have some old garbage cans on the farm. We've used them for a long time. Garbage in, garbage out. Garbage in, garbage out. Do you know how bad those garbage cans smell? At some point, you just have to throw the old thing away. You can't wash it out anymore. The old steel ones rust out because the garbage has tarnished the garbage can. It has an effect over time. There's so much garbage coming at us in the world. It's our responsibility to be discerning about what we let in and what we don't let in. Here's a better truth. Human beings are not moral garbage cans. They're finely tuned specimens created in the image of God designed to run on his power and his strength. How can we run that way if we're constantly feeding immoral fuel into our hearts and souls? Garbage in. Garbage has an effect. And then we try to get it out. Paul has said, Whatever is good, right, true, pure, bring that in. If it's not, change the channel. Turn the station. Put the book down. Get off the site. 
You are a finely tuned specimen created to operate under God's spirit and his strength. It doesn't matter so much what the world's doing. We're not responsible for them. We are responsible for us. And any one of us can get tripped up along the way. King David was described as a man after God's own heart. He was so passionate for the Lord. God was blessing him, and he was winning victory after victory, and his kingdom, as he was leading it, the kingdom of God was growing, kingdom of Israel. But 2 Samuel 11, 1 says, In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. And they were doing some, they had some victories there, but the scripture then says, David remained in Jerusalem one evening. David got up from his bed and he walked around the roof of the palace and from the roof he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful and David sent someone to find out about her. Notice when he saw her, he didn't change the channel. He went to find out a little more. The scripture says this, if you think you are standing firm, be careful lest you fall. King David ended up falling into adultery, a man after God's own heart. Wrote many of the Psalms. Jesus said it this way, Watch and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. The spirit inside of us is willing, but the flesh is weak. So Paul says, in his final exhortation, watch your mind. Be conscious of what you're putting in what you're thinking about. Whatever's true. You know, when something tragic happens, and we've had tragic things happen in our family, you've probably had tragic things happen in your family, the mind gets flooded with all the emotions and all the thoughts. There's so many hard things in life, isn't there? It's so painful at times. And in that darkness, we still get to choose our thoughts. And if you haven't memorized some truths that you can run through your mind in those darkest times, you might end up letting the wrong stuff in. I want to encourage you today. Do you have some baseline truths that you run through your mind again and again and again? In spite of what's happened, can you say to yourself, I know God has promised to be with me. That's a truth. He's promised to be with you. When you're starting to lose hope, do you have something you can say, look, I'm born into a living hope. I can't see hope in the circumstances, but I can put my hope in God. One thing I memorized a while back was this. God has a thousand ways when I can see none. When all my ways have reached their end, his ways have just begun. Do you know how many times I've said that to myself in my own mind over the course of my life? Hundreds, if not thousands of times. Because I have a tendency to be anxious, to be worried, to be insecure. And so when I say that to myself, and I say it over and over and run the faith tapes, and all of a sudden I start to believe it. God has a thousand ways when I can see none. When all my ways have reached their end, his ways have just begun. Another thing that I say to myself is, it's better to walk in the darkness and hold on to the light than go out and light your own fire. God, I'm just going to hold on to the light through this time. You've told me to hold on to you and abide and walk with you. You've got to have messages of faith that you run through your mind again and again and again. Whatever is true, he said, whatever is noble, Whatever's right, whatever's pure, whatever's lovely, admirable, excellent, praiseworthy. A couple questions. 
How much TV and news can you watch and still keep your peace? How much time can you spend on the internet before you lose your joy? Before fear starts to come in? Before hope dissipates? Anger stirs up in you? How much can you let in and still be victorious? Paul said in our responsibility with the mind is this, take captive every thought. If you feed the old dog, the old dog's going to sometime rise up. If you feed the new man, you're going to learn to walk in the new man. How much can you let in and still live in the fullness that God wants you to live in. Whatever's good, true, pure, holy, praiseworthy, think on those things. And then Paul says this, whatever you've learned or received or heard from me, don't just listen to it. Put it into practice. Put it into practice. And the God of peace will be with you. Sometimes God's peace is conditional on us. Are we doing our part? If you've lost your peace, maybe you should ask yourself what's been going on in your mind. We need each other. We need to encourage each other along the journey. What happens to me in the mornings is when I wake up for some reason, I get the bad thoughts when I'm laying there in bed. If I've had a restless night and my mind starts to think about this and think about that and worry about this. And then what happens to me is I'm like, well, I'll just stay right here in bed. And you know what I have to do? I have to roll over and I have to say, Lord, could you help me out here? You've gone before me hundreds of times. Would you go before me again today? I'm going to actually trust you today. I'm going to believe that you're going to carve the way for me. And I'm going to get out of bed and I'm going to start moving. And I'm going to take captive those thoughts and I'm going to try and get rid of them, cast them down. And I'm going to start moving by faith. And inevitably, you know what happens? When I get up and start moving in that way, all of a sudden his spirit comes and refreshes me. And all of a sudden, I start to remember, he was faithful in the past. He's going to be faithful again today. And I I trusted him with that in the past, and I can trust him again today. And all of a sudden, my mind starts to grow a little stronger in this. And then sometimes I'll get so strong and excited about it, all of a sudden I'll have to say, Tim, calm down a little bit. Because if you preach in that way, people won't like it. He is so faithful. But we have to win that battle in the mind. Paul's final exhortation. Now, we're not going to be done with Philippians here. He's got a few more words he's going to give. But I just want to ask today, have you learned this? Can you hear this? Paul says, can you receive this message? It's our responsibility in our sanctification before God. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, we thank you for your word. And we thank you that in grace that you have involved yourself with us through the gift of your Son and now through the gift of your Spirit. And you have promised when we come into Christ and put our faith in him that everything becomes new and we're given a new nature. But yet that new nature needs to grow and be strengthened. That new nature needs fed and encouraged. So you've given us your word to put into our hearts and into our minds. And that as we put your word into our hearts and our minds, our way can be kept pure. And somehow, mysteriously, as we take captive these thoughts before you and learn to think thoughts of faith and hope and peace and think on noble things, righteous things, excellent things, praiseworthy things, 
that somehow you work in us to give us that supernatural sense of assurance in you, confidence in you. So we ask that you help us with this, Father. Give us the desire, if we don't have a willing heart, give us the desire to want to manage our thought life, take captive those thoughts, learn how to proactively think with hope and faith, peace, love. Father, for those that maybe are here today who've never opened up their heart to the gift of your Son, perhaps today you'd be calling them to call on the name of Jesus. To say, Lord, I need you. Forgive my sin. Come in and be my Lord. Take over and show me your ways. Father, maybe you're calling someone even today, to offer that prayer. Thank you for this time together, Father. And as we turn now in singing, renew in us that passion, that desire to want to follow you with our whole lives, to be faithful to you till the very end. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. That's great. Thanks, Tim. Tim, as you were praying, I think it, it dawned on me this, that I think most of us probably underestimate how eager God is to encourage you and I when we make choices each and every day that would honor God, that would be about following him and about making decisions for him. Don't underestimate that uh, the power that raised Jesus from the dead is also uh, it's the, the wind in your sail and in mine that we can take advantage of as far as living a life of victory and peace that he wants us and joy that he wants us to uh, discover and share with others. So we're going to have a little fun as we sing at the end. So hopefully when you're a little toe tapping, we're going to sing, I have decided to follow Jesus. All right? And so uh, the challenge also, always is to not just sing these songs with our mouth and with the music, but as Tim said, to really have it be connected with our hearts and with our minds. So uh, let's sing uh, as joyfully as we can, as connected as we can, I've decided to follow Jesus. So we're going to get a little toe tapping, all right? So hopefully we can sing a little bit, and let's uh, ask God to uh, honor the choices. He is eager to honor the choices that we make for him each and every day. Here we go. Here we go. I have decided. I have decided. said when I was in college ministry, the two most significant decisions anyone ever makes, and I know we have some young people in here who haven't made this second one, who's going to be your master and who's going to be your mate, two biggest decisions we make in life. I hope you've made the decision to follow Jesus. He wants to offer you life and life to the full, and the more we follow him and grow deeper in him, the more these fruits can grow in our lives and we can enjoy walking with him in our lives. As you go today, I want you to remember the Lord goes with you. He goes before you to lead you and guide you. He goes behind you to uphold you and strengthen you. And he's promised to walk beside us, even within us, by the power of his spirit as our friend. And we hope you know him as your friend today. 
Before we sing our last doxology together, we're going to sing together. We're talking about our mind, and next week, Matt Reister is going to come, and he's going to encourage us. He's the president or the, I can't remember, director of the Bible conference, and he's going to talk to us about the Bible. And uh, the Bible says if you look into this, it'll con continue to do it and do what it says. You'll be set free by it. So I hope you'll join us for that message. Let's stand together and sing the doxology and praise to God, thanking him for this time. Thank you for coming, everyone. Have a great rest of your Sunday.